Only the Lord Almighty can force me to step down. And by that, I mean Barack Obama. UNFTR. Biden's carefully orchestrated punt came on the heels of the Republican National Convention, an assassination attempt on his rival for the presidency, and the ongoing fallout from a disastrous debate performance when the entire world witnessed the worst kept secret ever. Biden is not and has not been up to running the executive office for quite some time. Now, the ads had already stopped after the attempted assassination. Rumors of a defiant Biden closing ranks were circulating. He's angry with Obama, angry with Pelosi. Oh, the betrayal. Forget that he said he'd be a one-term president. I want to stay. It's my job. And you'll pry it from my cold, dead hands like a rifle in Charlton Heston's hands. And now he's the most patriotic narcissist since John McCain. You, sir, are a patriot for stepping down. Now step aside. Whatever. The jig is fully up now. They left it as close to the convention as humanly possible so that one major nagging reality would circumvent all of the other possible scenarios. The DNC had 92 million reasons to hold this announcement. That's the amount of cash that the Biden-Harris coffers had left on hand. Not Biden's coffers, the Biden-Harris campaign, which means that if she's the one anointed, then she gets to determine what happens with that money. And that's a lot of money. And so the decision, once again, has already been made for us. And immediately, the mainstream liberal media went into overdrive, selling us on the fact that, one, there's not enough time for an open convention. Two, the money's pledged to Kamala, so the decision is hers. And three, won't it be just desserts for Trump to lose to a black woman? Watch for yourself. Watch all of the major liberal pundits on mainstream outlets repeat these claims over and over and over again. Of course, there's this hilarious graphic from resident MSNBC dweeb Steve Kornacki, who I really like, by the way. But anyway, this one shows Biden's last head-to-head -head poll numbers with Trump. Before Biden's historic announcement that he was behind in the polls, it was 47 to 45 percent. And then there's this. After the earthquake announcement, here's Kamala Harris running a tight 46 percent to Trump's 47 percent. So let's get all of the talking points out of the way. We'll start with the tactical one first. Ready? The DNC couldn't push Harris out of the way because she's already half the ticket and the money's hers. Not to mention, she'll be the first woman of color in the position to become president. It would be kind of rude and unseemly and oh so undemocratic to pull the nomination from her and run an open convention. Really? That's the undemocratic part? Running a closed convention with a fait accompli nominee who ran last in the presidential primary in 2020, polls just as terribly as the person she's replacing, and stands for literally every single unpopular position that put Democrats in this place to begin with, is literally the most undemocratic thing that you could do. Here's another one. Why are progressives in the squad lining up behind Harris now like they did for Biden? If you're such a progressive, why aren't you supporting this move as well? As I've said before, there's no margin in progressives standing on the front lines of calling for the removal of Biden or denouncing Harris. Why? Because the Democratic convention has been ruined by superdelegates. Just watch the episode we did on that last week. If the progressives mount an offensive in the open, they'll be accused of spoiling the race when Harris eventually loses to Trump. And that's what's going to happen. More on that in a moment, because that's really the point here, isn't it? The progressives have a chance to make a really good showing at the convention with an organic floor nomination movement and some speaking slots to normalize some new faces and some old ideas, but the convention is a wrap. It's already been decided. So rather than be the patsies in a losing election year, the progressives aren't allowing the establishment to hang this upcoming drubbing around their necks. Instead, we're fighting for midterms in 2028 now, folks, because the establishment has made up its mind and we're not in the mix. Now, here's the really big one, right? What about the Supreme Court? Yeah, what about it? What about when you let Merrick Garland be blocked by Mitch McConnell? How about when RBG wasn't politely asked to step down when we could have done something about it? What about the Democrats on the judiciary making all of Leonard Leo's nominees for the court pinky promise that they'll be good instead of giving them the Robert Bork treatment? What about the clear, albeit thin, supermajorities over the years that would have allowed them to codify Roe into law rather than leaving it hanging by a thread on a bad precedent? You can't keep pulling the football away from us. But Trump is an existential threat. 
Couldn't agree more. His last term was a disaster. And now he knows where all the bodies are buried. And he also has the code to the men's room in the Oval Office. So you better start paying attention down ballot and putting some stuff on the agenda that resonates with people, such as, I don't know, expanding the child tax credit as a direct payment again, using those lame duck powers to wipe out student debt, or at least put a plan forward to refinance all student loan debt at reasonable rates to put private lenders out of business. Expanding Medicare and Medicaid and forcing private insurers out of the marketplace. Increasing the minimum wage. Implementing a windfall tax on corporations responsible for crushing consumers as they rack up historic profits. Demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. And an independent commission to rebuild Gaza. Force Israel to remove settlements in the West Bank lest they lose funding from the United States entirely. A path to citizenship and massive economic support in LAC nations to address the root causes of immigration. Universal background checks. No more fossil fuel subsidies. Greater union protections. All of those things pull really, really well and make an actual difference in people's lives. Instead, we're running an ideological replica of the person who lost the plot on all of these things to begin with. All you hear from the Democrats right now is fear. That's the playbook of insurgents, not incumbents. Think about all of the talking points and fundraising emails. It's all about Project 2025, abortion access, and general fear-mongering around Trump's statement that he'll only be a dictator on day one. And now they're on message talking about how old Trump is. They're rolling back all of the things that made people sick about him personally and ignoring the one thing that is nearly universal among voters around the country, black or white, Jewish or Muslim, working class or upper middle class, old or young. Economic insecurity. When Biden won in 2020, it's because Trump bungled a global health emergency. And he still got 74 million votes, which was 11 million more than he got against Hillary Clinton. It took historic turnout from voters who were burned out by Trump's erratic behavior and our general unease from the pandemic to get this guy out of office. And now, after two impeachments, former staffers sent to prison, an insurrection, multiple indictments, felony convictions that finally stuck on the guy himself, and even a fucking bullet to the ear, this guy's still standing and ahead in the polls. Why? Because when Americans are asked one simple question— Were you better off under Trump or Biden? The answer is resoundingly the same. And I'll give you a hint. It's not Biden. And I got to tell you, it's not about jobs. Because if your job doesn't pay enough to cover the bills, it doesn't matter. It was the historically socialist programs under Donald Trump because of COVID. And yes, I said socialist. That made his years economically palatable and people nostalgic for them. It's because of the socialist child tax payments, welfare relief, extended unemployment benefits, eviction moratoriums, student debt payment moratoriums, bankruptcy protections, free health care and free vaccines. Americans briefly got a taste of the awesome power of the American purse when it's put towards general health and welfare instead of corporate subsidies and warfare. And under a second Trump term, the last vestiges of these programs, to the extent that they even still exist will be stripped away and replaced by even more corporate-friendly measures, deregulation for the donor class, and incarceration, bankruptcy, and general punishment of the working class. All the while, the media will breathlessly sell you on the optics. It's good versus evil, black versus white, old against young, the past versus the future, soaring rhetorical flourishes that amount to nothing when you can't pay your mortgage or rent, your credit cards, or your student loans. That's what the pundit class and the establishment doesn't get. We've said from the beginning of this tortured affair that what matters come election time is how Americans feel about their economic prospects, not whether they have a job. It's not the same thing. Are they riding the wave, treading water, or under it? That's all. That's the majority. The Democrats want us to believe that bottom-up, middle-out is working, and it might very well be working for the corporate class, but there's a reason that those big financial packages they passed way back when were spread out over 10 years. The infrastructure bill was passed at the end of 2021, and the Inflation Reduction Act was toward the end of 2022, and both have a 10-year outlook and invested heavily in infrastructure-related projects and some poverty alleviation measures that need years to roll out in order to pay dividends for American workers. 
Democrats not only needed these to take root faster, but they needed to guarantee that they would hold on to at least the White House so they couldn't be overridden by new legislation in Congress. And in their haste to fuck progressives, they passed these bills, took out everything that was meaningful to progressives just to teach them a lesson. It was childish. They abandoned core Green New Deal initiatives, made important but only marginal gains on prescription drug coverage for seniors, punted on punishing corporations for collusion and gouging, abandoned the $15 minimum wage, removed all talk of Medicare for all from legislation or policy positions, didn't codify Roe into law, walked away from expanding welfare benefits such as paid family leave or the direct child tax credit payments. They held on to these as carrots for progressives and then they beat them with a stick whenever they asked about them. Well, guess what? You reap what you sow. And now you want our help? Again? Running a candidate from the same ticket that did all of this? That funds and supports the war in Gaza, leading to a historic collapse of support among voters of color and of Arab descent? That closed the border to appear even tougher than Trump on immigration, instead of fighting tooth and nail for a pathway to citizenship, thus leaving millions of undocumented workers under the threat of imminent deportation? that never once pressured the Federal Reserve to reduce interest rates and give people a break like Trump did? That let fossil fuel companies get away with documented price fixing and collusion, all the while expanding oil and gas leases? That continued to allow big tech companies to harvest and sell our data, to do the bare minimum on student debt relief, even though it was always and is still within your purview to pursue large-scale debt relief. So yeah, Forgive me if I'm not all that excited. The DNC and the donor class were so focused on extinguishing the last vestiges of leftist populism under Bernie that they forgot who they were supposed to be working for. Now, I know people who say that they will vote for a tuna can over Trump, and I completely understand. I also understand that when Trump survived that assassination attempt and raised his fist in defiance, that it gave cover to all of the middle-of-the-road Republicans who didn't want to admit in polite company that they want another tax cut and allow them to say, gotta hand it to him, he's tougher than I thought. We thought we would make history by electing the first woman president with Hillary Clinton because she was running against a pig. Well, guess what? In August of 2016, Hillary's unfavorable rating was around 56%. And as of July, Harris's is 51%. So more than half of likely voters found Clinton unfavorable. More than half now find Harris unfavorable, and that all speaks to turnout. Now, I know what you're going to say is, what about Donald Trump's unfavorable ratings? Doesn't matter. His were higher than Hillary's. They're still high. He's the greatest political anomaly in American history. But do not overlook our historic and endemic racism in this country, the fact that a lot of white people still want their tax cuts and want to blame other people for their economic malaise. Last time, it took a pandemic to get him out of office, and his supporters were so fucking energized, they turned out 74 million strong and then tried to overthrow the government. Do you really think there's that much energy on the Democratic side this time? As I've said a thousand times, Progressives lost this race a long time ago when none of our agenda items made it onto the ballot. The DNC also foreclosed on the primaries and put the donor class ahead of the working class. But sure, on the one day a year that you seem to care about everyone, a lot of us might still show up. We might hold our noses. And we won't say we told you so when Arab Muslims in Michigan don't show up. When black working class voters stay home because you sold them a bill of goods again. When disenfranchised Obama turned Trump voters stay with Trump or maybe go vote for RFK Jr. Good luck with that. Good luck with all of it. Sincerely.